beautiful day. Boy, tour of one of our one of our best known sites in military history in the state of Arkansas. I'm Rivis Edmonds and I'm working with the Department of Arkansas Heritage Agency, the Arkansas Historic Preservation Program, and I'd like to welcome you this afternoon to our Sandwiching in History tour of the Jacksonville Museum of Military History and the Arkansas Ordnance Plan Guard Shack. Uh, I'd like to th particularly thank, and she's not able to be out here with us at the moment, I'd like to thank Dana K. Dezer, the director of this amazing museum, for allowing us a tour of this amazing piece of our military history here in Arkansas. And if you have inside the guest book, inside the door of the museum, please be sure to do so uh, before, she, before you leave, because she would like to have a record of your visit. And the tour is worth one hour of HSW continuing education credit through the American Institute of Architects. Please see me after the tour if you're interested, and I will make sure that your information gets to the proper person in our agency. Well, what we're standing in front of today is part of what is remains of the Arkansas Ordinance Plant, and this is the guardhouse, which is one of the few remaining structures of the plant, a part of which was located on the ground of the Jacksonville Museum of Military History, which we are also standing next to. This is a square wood frame structure measuring 9 by 9 by 12 and has been mounted on metal skids for ease of relocation. It's presently mounted on a concrete pad to the wide of the main museum building and it is believed to be not very far from its original location. It was built in 1941 as part of the facilities of the World War II era Arkansas Ordnance Plant, which was a facility that produces fuses and detonators in Jacksonville and once covered over 7,000 acres that was purchased from a landowner named Harvey Land. Operated the plants. 
The Southwestern Proving Ground and Hope and the Pine Bluff Arsenal were government owned and operated. All the plans depended heavily on civilian workers for their main workforce, which was a challenge because, again, much of our normal male workforce had other missions, like going out and fighting the war. So, the wartime industries also brought needed money and jobs for Arkansas citizens after a very brutal decade of the Great Depression. And it contributed greatly to the economy of Arkansas and certainly its revival after those harsh years. After the war, the state, because of facilities like this, never really returned to the heavy agricultural-based economy that had been provident before the war, seeking instead to build a more industrialized economy. And of course, that brought a base, which when Winthrop Rockefeller came to the state in 1954, we were able to build upon. Arkansas Blue business and political leaders lobbied for these plants and pointed out the advantages of locating plants in Arkansas. Number one, we had unlimited supplies of natural gas and coal, particularly natural gas, because they were just literally burning it into the sky in South Arkansas. Um, Arkansas offered strategic locations away from the coastal areas of the United States where the government felt that the plants were safer from a foreign attack and from away from large population centers, but with a large available labor force. Yes, you had hundreds of thousands of people in the state who were ready to get off the farm, and of course the ordinance plans were a way to do it. With the able-bodied men needed for military service, the job of banning defense plans fell to people who had never really been in the labor force before or had been employed in the most low-paying menial work. Handicapped people, women who had never walked outside the home for the most part, young people, older adults, and African Americans were actually actively sought for employment. I mean, it was, come on, we need you. Young people often changed their papers or lied about their age, kind of sounds like the military. And the need for workers was so great that the employment officials did not check their ages, and in many cases, for a lack of documentation, really didn't have the means to do so. There was a switch in Arkansas. Segregation was still practiced in Arkansas then, but secretary of the employment facilities were still set aside for African American applicants. The plants were basically developed into almost self contained communities. They had sewer systems, water systems, and roads and rail lines were built within the site. Small lines were also built to connect to outside rail services. The plants had their own hospitals, fire departments, police departments, cafeterias, and several of the plants had recreation facilities on the site, which the cities were able to take advantage of after the war. All the sites were fenced in, plant guards could patrol the sites, and security was tight, and several of the plants produced their own newspapers and or newsletters. On June the 4th, 1941, the War Department notified Governor Homer Atkins and Congressman David Terry that a $33 million fuse and detonator plant was approved for immediate construction near Jacksonville. The plant was the first national defense industry approved for the state, or, and, and it ever had really operated in the state. And at the peak of production on November 22nd, 1942, over 14,000 workers were employed at the plant. The contract to design, construct, and operate the plant, as well as trade key personnel, was awarded to a firm named Ford, Bacon, and Davis of New York, making this plant a, again, a GOCO, government-owned, contractor-operated plant. It was kind of what we would call today a public-private partnership. The facility had several assembly lines and occupied clusters of buildings where fuses, boosters, detonators, and primers were produced. The first assembly line, and this is how fast we were getting wartime production ramped up and was reflected here in Jacksonville, the first assembly line was completed on March the 4th, 1942, and all the additional lines were fully operated by that summer. Now, as we mentioned earlier, 
a large majority, that much as 70 to 80 percent of the plant workers were women. Many were young women in their late teens and twenties who were in close proximity to young men who were training at nearby Camp Robinson. And yes, they were making money for the first time in years. <sighs> An emotional atmosphere would develop between these female trainees and other workers at these facilities, and also the men who were coming to train at nearby Camp Robinson. This led to the plant being described as a hotbed of passion for obvious reasons. <laughs> we don't need to go any further. Uh, by December 31st, 1944, there were also 3,085 African American workers working four lines and comprising 24% of the workforce, even though, it, even with the obvious need for workers, Governor Atkins still loudly objected to any African Americans being employed. Um, they also had 55 African American supervisors. The plant was in continuous production from 1942 until August of 1945, and just the, the pure scale of production that took place here. You had over 100 million primer, I'm sorry, 100 million primers, 1 billion detonators and relays, over 175 billion fuses, 300 billion percussion elements, and over 5 billion boosters, which that is a combination of a booster charge of high explosives and its container, which was normally a metal tube screwed into or otherwise attached to the adapter and extended down to the explosive charge of the projectile. And as I understand, it, those um, uh, were especially numerous in the hard fighting that took place in the Italian theater, um, which was, um, was, was what it take, took to really get up the Italian boot, for lack of a better term. As the war began to wind down, the number of employees needed increased, and by August 1945, the number of employees had dropped by more than half to 7,000. By the end of August 1945, another 600 employees were laid off, and the plant was completely closed by the following March of 1946. At that point in time, the plant facilities were put up for sale. Some buildings were leased or sold to industries that were located on site. Other buildings were removed from the site and taken to education facilities throughout Arkansas. Some of the land was sold back to their former owners. With a stipulation that the government needed the land again, it would be retaken. Well, guess what? Much of it was. Little Rock Air Force Base took in part of the former plant site in the 1950s, and some of the owners had to give up their land a second time. And I don't think there was a lot of objection, at least not, not that I know of. In 2002, the Little Rock Air Force Historical Foundation purchased a building located on the site of the former AOP Administration Building that was converted, as you see here, to the Jacksonville Museum of Military History. The museum first opened its doors in two, May 2005 with the mission to educate the public about the important contributions made by both the civilian workforce and the military in past and future conflicts. The initial intent of the museum was to preserve the history of the important home front contributions made by AOP workers in the war effort during World War II. As planning progressed, museum supporters soon realized that the scope of the museum should be expanded to include the rich military history of Jacksonville and the surrounding area. The history dates back to the Civil War, most notably the Battle of Reed's Bridge, also known as action at Bayou Vito, which was fought on August the 27th, 1863, as Confederate troops sought to hinder the advance of Major General Frederick Steele's Union Army towards Little Rock. The action is honored by a prominent exhibit located in the west wing of the museum towards the front. As you go into the museum and turn to your left, that's going to be the first thing you see. The history commemorated here extends generations into the Iraq War 
which engaged units at Little Rock Air Force Base, and also includes the history of the Arkansas Orphan Plant. With almost 15,000 feet of total display space, the Jacksonville Museum of Military History has an impressive collection of original World War II posters, including the now famous World, I'm sorry, the famous Four Freedoms posters that were illustrated by Norman Rockwell for the Saturday Evening Post in 1943 to highlight the speech given by President Franklin Roosevelt of the same name to Congress on January the 6th, 1941. The illustrations include, quote, the freedom of speech, the freedom of worship, the freedom from want, and the freedom from fear. The posters were widely distributed during World War II, but are now difficult to locate, particularly in the large three, three and a half to four and a half size that is displayed as you come into the entryway of the museum. Other notable artifacts include the dress uniform worn by, worn by Airman First Class Cindy Elia, the first enlisted woman to act as dining out sergeant at arms in the history of the U.S. Air Force. Unique to the museum and one of the largest exhibits is an exhibit with artifacts detailing the 1980 explosion of the nuclear Titan II missile during near Damascus along the Van Buren Baltimore County line. Popular at that time was a t-shirt that was once numerous around Central Arkansas and beyond asking the question, where were you when Titan II blew? <laughs> Have a blast in Damascus, Arkansas. I've been trying, trying to find someone that still might have one of those unique artifacts hanging around. I've had no such luck. There are also exhibits commemorating the wars that touched Arkansas, featuring what you will find to be a very unique Korean War exhibit on the desperate battle of the Chosen Reservoir that took place from November 27th to December 13th, 1950, just not very, not very many months after the initial North Korean invasion of the South. In order to avoid detection by the then superior North Korean forces, U.S. Marines who were holding their positions used the code, sent us Tootsie Rolls, to state that they needed ammunition. But somebody didn't catch the code. Because by mistake, in one particular drop, Tootsie Rolls were dropped. <laughs> at a, to a particular Marine unit trying to hold the Chosan line against the North Koreans. Now, they were a bit upset about the delayed ammunition drop. I think we would be too. <laughs> but it did come shortly afterwards that the ever resourceful Marines, even in the freezing conditions, found the perfect use for Tootsie Rolls in wintertime <laughs> in Korea. They, in fact, out that the Tootsies in those conditions could be used to plug bullet holes and fuel and water tanks and along with repairing damage from other steel implements of war. <laughs> Never do that for like eight years. There's also various other types of advancing military technology, including a 1970s vintage Air Force flight simulator that was used for many years at Little Rock Air Force Base. And of course, we could take a whole day to describe what's in here, and it's amazing. You need to see it. So as the museum, the museum continues to grow, new exhibits have included a history of Little Rock Air Force Base and other special exhibits such as an African-American military history exhibit. Future plans do also include a research and reading library, among other things. Folks, I'm glad that y'all were came today, and of course, we're day for our tour, and I know you're looking forward to uh, going through the crown jewel that's inside, so please, they're, they're waiting, they're, they're, they're definitely anticipating your visit, so please join us for our next Sandwiching in History tour on Friday, June 2nd at the Carmelite Convent and Chapel at 7201 West 32nd Street in Little Rock. And of course, with all of our sandwiching and history tours, we begin at 12. So hope to see you there and in our other future tours for the year. And if, just a reminder, if you're going to be dining out afterwards, 
please take advantage of the locally owned establishments because when you do so, you're creating a better community. Thanks so much for coming.